Good morning everyone and um, welcome to another session of the Dynamo Express webinar series and today my colleague Christoph Schmid will give a talk and uh, Christoph is uh, part of the development team at Dynamo here and he's mainly working on element formulations implementing improvement of element formulations and today he give a talk about or give you an overview about the solid ele element formulations we have in Alastina so this is barely on the surface. If you want to know more, uh, probably you have to book one of our classes. But I think his talk today will give you at least an idea of what kind of elements we have, what was new, how they behave, and give you at least some kind of direction what to choose for your particular simulation. And I think with that being said, I will hand over to my colleague, um, Christoph. Are you ready? Start to share my screen. And I hope you can all see the first slide. And I'd like to welcome everybody to this express webinar on solid element formulations in LS Diner. Mm. My name is Christoph Schmid. I've been working with Dynamo uh, for several years now, uh, looking into explicit and implicit simulations with a little bit focus on element formulations as well. And that's why I'm glad uh, so many people are interested in a topic that some would consider rather dry. Where do we find solid element formulations or for what application are they usually used? They range from uh, foam structures to rubber components or even rather in uh, all forming parts, metal sheets, or they also have applications in civil engineering and many more. You might have your own application, which is not shown here, but I think there are enough applications that said it's well worthwhile uh, to look into uh, the solid element formulations. But what exactly are solid elements? Uh, and how are they used in LS Diner? So solid elements are basically three-dimensional finite elements where the finite element mesh visually looks like the physical system compared to shell elements or beam elements where you always have to make assumptions or a structural approximation uh, for at least one dimension. The advantage for the solid element is that it's very effective to assemble even complicated geometries because you see what you mesh directly and it's more easy to apply boundary and loading conditions so they are applied more realistically where they appear for a shell you only have the mid surface that can be shifted and there you have to uh, constrain sometimes uh, rotational degrees of freedom, but for solids you have all the freedom. And usually there are no consecutive assumptions required when you think of material modeling. But there's always something, some shortcomings. If you model, you can see here this simple cube, it consists already of a lot of elements. So mesh refinement is usually expensive, especially if structures are bulky. So you have a real three dimensional body. And this is also a curse of dimensionality. So you have a lot of degrees of freedom you need to solve. And therefore you also have a higher effort, let's say in mesh preparation, the CPU time, and of course also post-processing because you have a lot of data you have to post-process. And there are uh, other drawbacks that other element formulations have too, like shells and beads. They sometimes have poor performance for especially thin wall structures or low order formulations. Because if you directly approximate the continuum mechanics with linear element formulations so with linear edges you, you make approximations that introduce an error into your formulations and then you see something like a 
locking. Um, that needs to be sometimes measured somehow, and you will see there are some formulations to take care of that. Okay. Here I listed some requirements for solid formulations or requirements, maybe most, most of you also would consider to be important. And the requirement that is, um, I think, most important is there's no locking behavior or rubber like structures if you don't have volumetric locking because then you would get a wrong result that is not suitable to make a prediction for your application. Also, a good bending performance is important, especially if you bend your structure. And there should be no mesh distortion sensitivity, which might be important if you have a huge deformation and elements deform a lot. And you don't want to use adaptive mesh refinement, then it's important to have a good mesh distortion uh, robustness. And what we sometimes also are looking at is force mesh accuracy, because the size of real engineering applications really complex sometimes. And this does not allow that you model everything with a converged mesh because then the runtimes would explode. And the two last points are not the least points. Of course, it's important to have good robustness so to get comparable results if you run on the one machine or the other. And the results that should not be too sensitive and everything should be done in a reasonable time. And here in this figure, I have one of the most common problems, the shear locking problem. If you consider a linear element, linear, I mean, there's a linear connection between this node and this node, then you are not able to predict the pure bending mode because there is some spurious shear deformation that will be triggered. This can lock up your structure. But there are some ways to countermeasure that. We have some element technology ready from the literature and from trial and error over the last 20 to 30 years now. And I think one of the most common is the reduced integration, the stabilization, or a selective reduced integration, some mixed methods where you mix the design of your strain field to overcome those locking problems. We have nodally based formulations where you maybe average or introduce new degrees of freedom like your nodes to predict your results more realistically. And there are Composite formulations, so called macro formulations, here I do not mean composites. I mean that one element is composed of several sub elements to improve its uh, behavior. And there are other point based elements, or especially in the foliation elements. And everything is a little bit mixed up. Uh, and the uh, Element library in Nelestina is meanwhile quite large. So it's like a small safari. We will have a first look uh, now on the next slide on all the element formulations that are commonly used for structural solid mechanics. And let's see if we find one that is interesting for you, or maybe there's something you can learn about element formulations you already use. That would be nice. And here's an overview that you might see when you look into the keyword manual. On the left side, I have a selection of the called estahedron elements. It ranges from minus 18 in while up to 62. And the minus 18 and 62 are new elements. Uh, New and the more basic elements or default elements are here in the middle. Which, uh, one, the constant stress solid that can be turned into a Cosarite point element. And there are 
some other formulations too. Here on the right side, you see the hadron element types. There are also the basic ones or the element formulation 10 and 13 you might have heard of, but there's also a quadratic version like 16 and 17. There's also a new element type 16, which is still under development, I think. And in order to connect hexahedrons and tetrahedrons, there are pentahedron elements. And you can see here, you can connect this four noted shape easily with the pentahedron and this triangular surface with this triangular surface. What I have not shown in this overview here are there are more higher order element formulations to come. There are also cohesive and gasket formulations, isogeometric element formulations, arbitrary Lagrangian or Larian formulation, element free formulation, and some more. But we will not talk about them. We will talk more or less about those element free relations. And we will start with the most classic one the constant stress solid element in Alice Diner. Form one default. And you can see here in this picture that it uses only one integration point and it has eight nodes with three degrees of freedom at each node. So we have 24 degrees of freedom in total, but we compute only one single stress value because we want to be efficient. So that's the aim of this element to be efficient and at the same time accurate. And the advantage of using only one integration point is that it can sustain even the largest nonlinear deformations. So it's very suited for applications where you have huge deformations, but to require an hourglass control where you produce an hourglass formulation and the proper values, because this is something artificial to stabilize the element and it needs to be as realistic as possible. There are good recommendations, but you have to choose. It might be a shortcoming. And here in this picture, you see what happens if you don't have a proper hourglass stabilization, like stretching this notch steel specimen, where only one quarter is meshed, and you don't use an hourglass stabilization, then something like this can happen. This hourglassing pattern here can appear. And with the right hourglass control, the results look like you expect them. So let's look on how to control hourglass for this element formulation. Several so, has an own library for hourglass uh, formulations. The oldest ones are formulation one to five. They divide into viscous and stiffness forms. The business forms are suited if you have high velocities so for impacts or ballistic simulation, and for lower velocities, the fitness formulation. And difference in them is that some of them use an approximation for the volume, and some use the exact volume integration, what is what we, we would recommend in, in general. Type six, this is a, I think the most uh, known, it's also recommended in most situations. It's a quintessential bending incompressible hourglass control by Belichko and Bindemann. We will hear something of them uh, on a later slide. And in this hourglass stabilization, we use elastic constants. And for some applications, a modified value for the hourglass stabilization and scaling factor with this QM uh, makes sense. For example, if you have only elasticity in your problem, then you can increase sometimes this value from 0 0.1, which is the default to one, and then you would get a good coarse mesh accuracy. But as soon as you have plasticity, due to the fact that elastic constants are used for the hourglass stabilization, you would have to reduce this value. So it's a good idea to always watch hourglass energy to see if it's small enough to have a good enough 
solution. And this hourglass stabilization is also used very successful in the implicit analysis. Then there is type seven, which is pretty similar to type six, but instead of an incremental update of the deformation, it uses a total deformation update, which will make it spring back into its original deformation, no matter uh, what happens. And this is why this formulation is recommended to use keywords like initial foam reference geometry. And there's a more sophisticated type nine. It's a more accurate formulation, even for initially distorted meshes. And here we have also the feature that the hourglass stiffness may be based on current material properties for these three very common material models. So during the stabilization, it then takes into account the current state of material. It can be a good advantage to be less dependent on the hourglass factor. Okay, so this was a lot of information on L form one with hourglass stabilization. Now we go away from hourglass stabilization. Look at an eight point hexahedron element. <laughs> L form two. It has the same basic structure, but instead of one integration point, it uses eight integration points. What you could say is the standard integration or full integration. So there is no need for hourglass stabilization. But there were the shortcomings of locking for bending performance or volumetric locking. And there are some things that can be done. One of the most simple things is to apply the B bar method, which alleviates volumetric locking by assuming a constant pressure throughout the element. Because we compute eight stress, uh, eight times the stress for the element, but we assume that pressure is constant. We would take care of the volumetric locking. This is one way. Counter act on volumetric locking, but if it's a material where volumetric locking is not going to appear, then it's sometimes better to use full integration. There's a list in the manual where you can find materials that are more compressible or that are made for compressive simulations with compressible material, then it's better to use the full integration and not assuming the pressure is constant. Of course, if you have those eight points and you do a lot of computations at them, it's lower than L form one. And there's another drawback. It can be more unstable in large deformation applications because if you squeeze down this element or compress it very much, then it can happen that the internal transformation matrix between the element system and the global system might get a negative Jacobian then the transformation gets very difficult numerically. Besides volumetric locking, there's also the bending performance. And here, this element is usually way too stiff. So pure bending modes trigger, like in the picture I showed before, spurious energy. And this is unfortunately getting worse for poor aspect ratios. And what we can do is okay, we can use Reduced integration with L form one. Then we have to make a choice for a proper hourglass stabilization. But there are other ways. We saw the list in the beginning. We can use a modified or enhanced strain formulation where we have L form minus two, minus one, and now new minus 18 and 62. Or you can switch to a higher order formulation like 23. But let's look. At an uh, improved version of this element. They are called minus one and minus two. Minus two is a more accurate formulation. And you can see here, I triggered the hexahedron into a flat shape to show, okay, it can handle this flat shape because 
the overall behavior is the same, but uh, the same as L form two, but for taking care of the poor aspect ratios that trigger the spurious shear energy, there is an assumed strain approach in this element, which reduces the spurious stiffness without affecting the true physical behavior. This is simply done by computing the aspect ratios and inserting them in another way into the transformation matrix in the element. And due to this modification, the element formulation gets a little bit slower than L form two. What do I say a little bit? It's two to 3.5 times slower than L form two. And because efficiency is really an important requirement, this is sometimes too much. So there is an efficient implementation of this element formulation, which is only 10 to 20% times lower than L form two. But due to this more efficient implementation, so if you leave something out, then there is a side effect, weak deformation mode, which can look similar to an hourglass mode, but it's not truly hourglassing because this is a fully integrated element formulation. So there will be no hourglass stabilization. The stabilization you could use, you see, this weak deformation mode is to switch to L form minus two simply. But in most cases, it's sufficient. So experience shows that it's working well in, in most situations. And we have the nodal rotation solid. Similar to L form two, it also has eight nodes, but it uses also rotational degrees of freedom. And you can think for the derivation of those rotational degrees of freedom uh, of the anti node hexahedron, where you use quadratic shape functions. And it's derived from this 20 node hexahedron by reducing those mid edge nodes and turning them into those rotational degrees of freedom. And if you use so many degrees of freedom and virtually uh, you are able here to have a better alleviation of, let's say, volumetric locking, maybe you need more integration points to take care of the higher information level inside the element. The advantage of having rotational degrees of freedom is that it's well suited for the connection to shells. It shows good accuracy for small strains. Of course, if you use more integration points and more degrees of freedom, you're slower than element formulation two. And still, it has tendencies also to volumetric locking. Now, let's look at the next element, which will be this anti node hexahedron. It's the uh, L form 23. So it uses also the eight corner nodes plus 12 edge nodes, so called mid side nodes. And if you use only those mid side nodes, you will sometimes see the description serendipity formulation. So the mid face nodes are missing. That is uh, what is the Lagrangian, or the Lagrange class, sometimes it's called, of element formulations where you have 27. Because this one is faster than that one. It needs also 14 integration points. And it has, of course, because here those edges are not straight anymore. If you think again of the bending example, it has an improved bending performance and at the same time reduced volumetric loss. And it is a big advantage that often coarser measures are sufficient. Because this element will, of course, be much more expensive than L form 2, but you might not need as many elements like for L form 2. And if you just want to try it out, there's an easy conversion of 8 nodal hexahedra. You have just to append the option H8 to H20 to element solid, and those mid side nodes are automatically generated. So, enough of 
hexahedron. Now let's look at the tetrahedron uh, element formulations in Alice Liner. We have the standard tetrahedron that forms 10. It uses only one integration point. Now you would say, okay, and we need hourglass stabilization. No, it's not a case for tetrahedral elements. There is no need for hourglass stabilization. And that is valid for all tetrahedra. There will be no hourglass stabilization necessary. But the big disadvantage of this element, because it looks quite lean, has three degrees of freedom at each node and only four nodes. So it has only half the number of degrees of freedom than our L form two, but it's usually much more stiff. It shows volumetric blocking also. And that's why it's only applicable for foams where Poisson ratio tends to be zero. And it's that stiff that it's usually also not recommended in general. Can be used as a transition element or Sometimes it's even better to use a pure tetrahedron mesh compared to a degenerated X element mesh. But there's also an improved version of this one, it's F130. You can see here that one thing done in the nodes. We average the pressure of the nodes to alleviate volumetric locking. For L form two, it was the B bar approach where we assumed a constant pressure throughout the element. Here, we average the pressure between neighboring elements to balance the locking due to a volumetric deformation. This requires some work in the material models also, and that's why only common models are supported for explicit, but for implicit, all material models are supported. And one thing that you should keep in mind when using this element is that parts with different materials should not share nodes because if you average the pressure between two parts with a different part modulus, you will get some spurious energy. It does not fit. An exception is, of course, if the materials use the same part modulus for the quantity to compute the pressure. It's way better in its performance than L2. Uh, 10, of course, if you have a Poisson ratio greater than zero, so that is the case for metals and rubber, because it shows significantly less volumetric locking, and it's also well suited for almost nearly incompatible material behavior. Similar to L form three, we have also a tetrahedron element with nodal rotations. And it's also derived from its quadratic part. So pretty much the same uh, way it's derived. And it uses also more integration points instead of one integration point, it needs at least four. Or you could choose to use five integration points. It uses some selective reduced integration to alleviate volumetric locking can also be connected to shells due to the rotational degrees of freedom. There's also a good accuracy for small strains, but still has the tendency to volumetric locking. So those elements are interesting, having those rotational degrees of freedom, but they are not perfect. There are also quadratic tetrahedron elements, which perform pretty good. They're here yeah, at form 16 and 17, I put them on one slide because they are very similar. They also need four or five point integration, with good accuracy, but of course high CPU cost because you have much more degrees of freedom. And they should be used, especially for contact, uh, if possible with a part definition, or you have to make sure the segments for the contact are properly identified. Because if you think of a contact segment that is only created from the corner nodes, then you are missing somehow the information at those mid-side nodes. Because instead of one 
segment that would be used for the four-nodal tetrahedron, you have now one, two, three, four segments for contact that would have to be generated. With part definitions, it is done automatically. Similar to L form 23, there's also an easy conversion from the linear version, the four noted TET, by appending TET4 to TET10 to the element solid definition. And you can also have all the mid side nodes that are also created automatically in your output if you like. Now, this is the quadratic formulation in L form 17. It's pretty similar, but it's composed of 12 linear sub hadrons. So this is the composite element formulation. It's nothing to do with composites. It's simply composed of sub-elements, what we call the macro formulation. And now the next two element formulation, the hadron. Look like a piece of cake, some say, and they are very good to connect from hexahedra to a tetrahedra, but they should not be used in a pure pentahedra mesh because usually the performance is poor. They tend to use them only as a transition. They come with a two point or one point integration. Both need hourglass stabilization. Those are elements that need again hourglass stabilization. But yeah, as I said, it's better to use them only as transition. Now I have on the next three slides some um, more uh, recent element formulations in the library. So it's L form minus 18, which resembles a lot. To L form two, because it again uses eight integration points, eight nodes, and the displacement degrees of freedom. But inside this element, there are 13 incompatible nodes. What does that mean? Those incompatible nodes you can think of like deformation modes that are coming from an element that is one or two orders higher, but it's not represented by nodes, but only internally. And because it's only internal between neighboring elements, there can be an incompatibility, which disappears with mesh refinement and it yields really accurate results in most cases. Because there are nine incompatible modes to improve bending and four to counteract on volumetric locking. And they need to be solved somehow. So it requires the solution of the compatibility equation in each element, which makes this element really expensive or explicit, usually, two to five times slower than L form two, is what we have seen so far. But this number or this range is really large. It depends on the severity of the element deformation and or the nonlinear effect in the material because this compatibility equation depends on that too. In implicit, this is seen to be relative because compared to the global linear algebra in implicit, usually the element expenses are insignificant. And if you have Increased accuracy in implicit usually this helps to speed up convergence. So this can compensate for the cost. So this is an element that can be used in explicit. If you need really high accuracy, then maybe only a coarser mesh would be sufficient, or it can be used in implicit. There has been for a long time a similar version using 12 incompatible modes in LS Liner, it's the plus 18, so they're related in their names, but this is only suited for linear implicit analysis. Uh, a lot of applications for that too, like eigenvalue analysis, MDH applications and so on, 
that is minus 18 is really suited for structural applications. Compared to that, we have the QBI solid, the uh, form 62, it's also new. And we heard that name earlier. It's the fully integrated version of the quintessential bending incompressible element by Bilicko and Bindemann. I gave the reference down here too. In this uh, paper, the uh, uh, Bindemann and Jack Bilicko, they derived at the same time the fully integrated and the hourglass stabilization uh, that can be used. And here is the fully integrated version that does not need hourglass stabilization. It uses an assumed strain field to either act on shear and volumetric locking on both. So it has an enhanced bending performance. And compared to L-form 2, it's not that low. It's pretty much faster than L-form minus 18, but uses completely different approach to counteract on the quantum problems we see in those low order simulations. And on the next slide, we see a family of higher order solids which remain uh, right now still under development. Are they are in the recent versions of Alice Minor, or if you use in development version, already there. They are not fully supported yet. You can try to use them. You know, have a quadratic family 24, 25, 26, which refer to the hexahedron, pentahedron, and tetrahedron, where we have a lot of nodes now that need to be entered by using these options H27, 20, P21, T15. And for the cubic family, it goes up to 60. Four nodes. And I call them a family uh, because when you look at the phases to connect those elements, you can see this matches pretty good. So this phase can be connected to that one. And this phase of the tetrahedron here can be connected to that one. So you can have a fully quadratic mesh, also mixed mesh, and the same holds for the cubics. Okay. And be connected to. So that was the safari through the element formulations. I hope you can use those slides. It's a helpful uh, cheat sheet in your everyday simulations. And now we will have a short, closer look at some comparisons and statistics on how those elements can be formed in uh, two test cases and prepared um, a space to see how well is the bending performance of the elements. And um, you know, in other words, is shear locking avoided? We have a three point bending test of an aluminum strip, which goes into plastic bending. And we do a short convergence study where we keep an aspect ratio of four to one. So this will definitely induce some shear locking if it's not alleviated. And we go up to eight pies in thickness direction. Of course, for practical uh, everyday simulations, this would be too much, but in this convergence study, we will just want to see what happens. And for taking a closer look at the tetrahedral formulations, we split simply each hexahedron into tetrahedron elements. And this splitting algorithm here uses simply five sets per hex. So you can see that here. So you have a comparable mesh. And this is the result of the maximum energy. I compare the maximum energy because the formation is fixed. And you can see now from the maximum energy, if the 
element produces more energy. And now, okay, it's too stiff. The stresses will be too high because they will have a lot of spurious amount of shear energy, maybe. You can see right here for element type two, there's this peak for the coarse mesh, and it is reducing to this value, this baseline, which I defined as the, the converged value with all the element formulations. And you can clearly see, okay, type two is too stiff, but type one seems to be close to convergence. But you would say, okay, but this first value is much too low. It's too soft here. This value for only one element with thickness, with one integration point with thickness, is simply dominated by the hourglasses, which disappears with mesh repartment. Minus one, minus two, which counteract on the good aspect ratios. So good uh, convergence behavior. Type three with the nodal rotations, a little bit less stiff than type two, but still has some uh, spurious stiffness. Type 62 is already better, so it's capable of uh, avoiding the, the locking effect. Minus 18 has an even better cross mesh accuracy, and 23, the quadratic one, you could already maybe use the closest mesh or one mesh refinement more. So this is what is uh, meant by coarse mesh accuracy. You don't need to insanely uh, increase the number of elements. On the side of the tetrahedra, you can here clearly see type 10, which is not recommended in general because it's usually way too stiff, so even with the Eight plies across the thickness, uh, not getting even close enough to the uh, convergence line. At 13, it's uh, also very stiff. At four, improves with the nodal rotations. That's more accurate. And the uh, quadratic versions are also in force meshes, far more accurate than the linear versions. Now let's compare run times. You can see here I have normalized the run time to L form two with the eight integration points. And you can see okay, the one dot point element, the L form one is much cheaper, it's uh, efficient, minus one, 10 percent slower, minus two. two almost three times slower what is expected due to the modifications of the frame. And here with the nodal rotations, also slower. 562 is, as promised, not too much uh, slower than type 2, minus 18, also as expected because of the incompatible modes inside this element requires more computation time in explicit. And type 23, the quadratic one, of course, requires also more, but let's keep in mind for those elements here that showed a very good cross mesh accuracy, the cross of mesh would have been sufficient, and then maybe the run times could be much more comparable again. It's pretty similar for the tetrahedron elements for type 10 and 13. They are almost uh, close to this one, a little bit cheaper, and we'll talk about that, how they can be compared to the hexahedron element with the nodal rotations. Of course, it's getting more expensive and the quadratic ones even more. But here again, you could have also used the coarser mesh, and then it would be much more comparable. But how does this now compare that the linear tetrahedrons with one point integration are so comparable to L form two with? Eight point integration. And I wanted to explain that a little bit because usually what the experience is that if you use tetrahedrons, you get this curse of dimensionality in a uh, even more dramatic way because you need way more elements. And then people tend to say, okay, with tetrahedrons, the runtime gets up 
But here it's not the case because I did simply split one hexahedron into those five tetrahedra. And then you keep the eight nodes. There are no nodes inside. So you have eight nodes and three degrees of freedom in both cases. And here you have only one element with eight integration points. Here you have five elements, which require each only one integration point. And due to the shape, time step size is similar. So the cost is almost comparable. And it was even a little bit faster. But if you think now, this is a very special tetrahedron mesh, I would say. Why should you use a tetrahedron mesh if you could use a hexahedron? That's the question here. So usually if you would mesh an auto mesher or structured meshing, map meshing, you would get a more common tetrahedron mesh. It would look like this. Simply did that with a comparable edge length compared to this hexahedron. And then you would already get 29 nodes and three degrees of freedom, so almost uh, 60 degrees of freedom, and 48 elements with one integration point. And on top, it would be required that you use a smaller step size, and then this would be more expensive. So it would roughly estimate the expense of uh, using tetrahedrons with a free tetrahedron mesh. Its structure is very simple. And for comparison reasons, we could use the simple split algorithm. But in a real engineering application, yeah, you would get more tetrahedron elements, and then it would be more expensive. Then we saw on this example the banding performance, some um, comparisons of the runtime, and here we have. An example where volumetric locking needs to be avoided. Very common example, the Taylor bar impact. And copper bar, that is simply having a huge initial velocity hitting a, a rigid wall in our case. And this generates usually large strains in the plastic flow. And you can see if volumetric locking is avoided. You can see here when we look at the deformation from top view, you can see the bottom uh, um, spreading up um, with L form one, L form two, minus one, minus two, minus 18, and so on. We get comparable results, but some elements show strange results like this wavy shape, or in this case, not a circular shape. Well, from three with the nodal rotation. Here, those are the elements where the volumetric locking is not avoided. Then you get strange results, you could say, maybe. And if you would look at the pressure across the elements, you would see something like a checkerboard mode, which means between neighboring elements, the pressure changes its sign. This can lead to such anomalies like this wavy shape. Okay, I have some more statistics. What we were talking about performance and efficiency and in aggregate. Usually efficiency is crucial and crucially depending also on the critical time step. You can see the formula in which it is computed here. And it's really depending on an element formulation uh, information, the characteristic length which is computed differently for the different shapes of elements. So for the common eight noted elements, it's simply the volume divided by the maximum surface. You have a thin sheet. It will be usually boiling down to the thickness of the sheet. It's a little bit more complicated for tetrahedrons. Here you can see the different formula. The that are used in tetrahedrons. And you can see directly there's some characteristic height in the element. And for the linear element formulations, it can be used directly for 85% of it. But for the quadratic shape, it needs to be reduced due to the higher order element formulations. 
that will, will trigger higher order deformation modes for the pentahedron. It looks like this. But those are only formula. I also have a slide where we have the values compared. So we have here the time step size for the solid elements when we use the same patch length. And here we see L form one, two, and it's the related parts in three. They are the base with one. You can see if you use the quadratic one, we need to reduce the step size by more than 20%. For the tetrahedrons, with the same edge length, uh, around 20%. We use the nodal rotation. So you can the quadratic part is even 30% reduced. For the quadratic, even more. And the pentahedron are about half the size. Easy to see because two hadrons next to each other would compose a hexahedron. And here are some more uh, statistics summarized. Maybe this helps uh, for some comparisons. The number of integration points for the constant stress solid is only one. Here it's all eight. For uh, the nodal rotation, we need 14 and the quadratic one also. The uh, simple tetrahedrons use only one the quadratic ones of nodal rotations, four or five. For the pentahedrons, we use one or two integration points. And here below, the number of degrees of freedom for eight nodes times three translational degrees of freedom, we use nodal rotations already doubled. For the quadratic one, we have 60. Well, for the simple tetrahedrons, 16 with nodal rotations are included. And here we have. 30 for the quadratic version, so it's half the number of degrees of freedom compared to the quadratic hexahedron, and 18 again for the pentahedron. And now we come to the last slide with some conclusions and remarks for the good, maybe take into account for your simulations. And those remarks are never. Final because there's always some movement in the designer to improve the element formulations. But I would say those recommendations are more or less in general. Use hexahedron elements if possible. I form one with hourglass, six usually works, or I form two or three. The structure is rather flat. You can think of minus one or minus two, or even 20. Three, the quadratic one, maybe with a coarser mesh. Also for minus 18, maybe a coarser mesh, 62, those are the new candidates. Uh, can be tested now in new versions. And if it's not possible to use hexahedron uh, element shapes, then of course it's required to use tetrahedron elements. So we have uh, 16, 17, the most accurate tests uh, there are. But they might be not suited for a lot of grains due to this element distortion sensitivity that might arise. Then at form 13, we saw that it really needs a finer mesh, especially in bending situations, but it's well suited even for large strains. We should check if the material supported due to the pressure averaging. For metals or plastics with moderate strain, we can uh, you can use all of the set elements, but not the uh, too stiff type 10, only when the Poisson ratio is close to zero. The rubber materials or really incompressible uh, materials with large strains, we should use type 13. And if it's really large strains, uh, more large than large, then you should think of using even a uh, mesh adaptivity. Here you can use or for type 13. And the hadron elements, as I said, should only be used as transition elements. And another point you should keep in mind when we think of this more expensive element type minus 18, maybe in implicit analysis, those cocktail element formulations may be used 
because the expense in the elements is not as significant for the speed, the overall speed or runtime of the simulation compared to explicit analysis. We need element formulations for both uh, types of analysis. That being said, I really like to thank you again for your interest in uh, this rather dry topic. Oh. To maybe learn something that you did not knew about old formulations, or at least learn something about new formulations and that you can use to apply the uh, yeah, reference to look at uh, if you do not want to read through all the keyword handles. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you, Christoph. Um, this was a pretty interesting talk, and I hope you. Um, at least got an idea about the element types you can choose. I'm pretty sure we're going to do a follow-up to this one and then we're going to talk about shell elements. Um, but for the moment, if you have questions um, or further questions, feel free to contact us, send us a message at Dynamo, support at Dynamo, contact us by mail, by phone. And yeah, I think we are happy to help and solve your problems or at least assist you in solving your problems. With that being said, um, thanks again and see you next time.